One of the most well-known crowning moments of the entire Gundam franchise was the final chapter of the conflict between Amuro Ray and Char Aznable that played out in the super hyped movie Char's Counter-Attack. Not only was this the first movie with an original story, but also the ending of a saga that started almost 10 years prior with the original Mobile Suit Gundam. So to say that this movie was a big thing is really an understatement. Finally, after the torches double Sera, we were going to see Amuro and Char back in action piloting a mobile suit. So, guided by Tomino's hand, we went full circle and all the way back where it all started. Amuro in a Gundam fighting for the Federation against Char and his red mobile suit fighting for Zeon's ideals. And there's something quite poetic about that. Behind the scenes, Char's counterattack had a somewhat rough development since Tomino wrote the original story one year prior, in 1987. This is what we now know as Mobile Suit Gundam High Streamer. The problem was that when Double Zero was airing and the movie adaptation for said story was greenlit, Tomino decided to rewrite the plot to add a couple of extra characters and change Amuro's relationship. But Sunrise didn't like the new story, so in the end, the movie Char's Counter-Attack is a revised version of the original High Streamer. The thing is that Tomino did like the new additions he made to the story, so he went ahead and completed that different version and published it as a new novel called Beltor Chica's Children. So we can safely say that there are three versions of Char's Counter-Attack. The movie, which is the main point of this video, the original novel called High Streamer and the alternate novel called Beltor Chica's Children. The story plays out very similar on the three versions, but the characters are somewhat different. Chan in one and Irma in the other and it is in the mobile suit designs where we can find the biggest difference. The new Gundam is replaced by the high new Gundam and the Sasabi by the Nightingale. Back to the story, the movie is quite interesting. It works as the final capstone for the entire franchise of that era, but at the same time, it doesn't rely too much on continuity. As a matter of fact, all of the plot of Double Zeta is hardly mentioned, and regarding secondary characters, aside Bright, Astonaji, Mirai, and Mirai's ex fiance who appeared way back in the OG series, not many more of them return. That makes it a little bit easier to follow if you haven't watched the previous series. And also, if you're only there for the action, then don't worry. The fights are very well choreographed and amazing. So even though the movie moves quite fast, you will almost surely grasp the story. Can you enjoy the movie if you haven't watched the previous series? Probably yes, even though you will lose some context and details. Do I advise you to not watch the first three entries? Nah, if you have the time, then do it. It's a much more rewarding experience if you know all of the backstory and the context, even Double Zeta. With all that said, my name is Absa, and before we explore the movie, let's go very quickly through all of the events that led up to Char's counterattack. Oh, and well, one more thing, there will obviously be spoilers in this video, so if you haven't seen the movie or the original Mobile Suit Gundam, Zeta Gundam and Double Zeta, well, I don't know what you're doing here, but grab a comfy seat and let's all enjoy the ride. The Universal Century Calendar was established when mankind first started to live in space. Many years passed and living in a colony was widely accepted, but more or less in the sixth decade, people started to resent the Earth's government. The Principality of Zeon was established on UC0069 and for 10 years they developed experimental weapons and their technology to prepare their armies for an eventual uprising against the Earth. UC0079 marked the start of the One Year War and towards the end of the year is where the original Mobile Suit Gundam series takes place. Between 0079 and 0083, various side stories takes place, some of them being Gundam Thunderbolt, the 8th team, and even War in the Pocket. In 0083, after the events of Operation Stardust, the Titans were formed. 
all of this plays out in the Stardust Memories OVAs. Eight years after the One Year War ended, the battle between the Titans, the Ayuk, and Axis Sion takes place in UC 87 in Sera Gundam. After that three way war, the Titans were wiped out and the Ayuk was in a bad shape. So Axis Zeon rebrands as Neo Zeon, and the first Neo Zeon war happens in UC 88 in Double Zeta Gundam. Peace was then achieved when Haman's Neo Zeon is defeated, but six years later we would find out that the Red Comet was still alive and was now the leader of another Neo Zeon. Or rather, he took all of the Zeon remnants and formed a new Neo Zeon. Anyway, it's now UC 0093 and the second Neo Zeon war is looming on the horizon. Just like in the original Mobisuit Gundam, Char's counterattack starts immediately amid a conflict between Zeon and the Federation. This time, Char's Neo Zeon is trying to drop the asteroid 5th Luna into Earth to destroy the Federation's headquarters, now located in Lhasa, Tibet. Something that probably, definitely, is a callback to Zeon's original colony drop aimed at Jabu. This decision to start right in the middle of the action is something that only happens in the movie, as Tomino's original story does explore what Char and Neo Zeon are doing before and how they got there. The truth is that we are brought up to date with all of those events thanks to a couple of lines of dialogue by Chan. The movie starts right off by showing us that Amuro wants to help to stop Char, but his new mobile suit is not completed. His new mecha is an experimental weapon that is using new technology called Psychoframe, something that would be very relevant in future Gundam entries. He is still a member of the Earth's Federation, yet he is now part of Londo Bell, a new special task force unit that is under the command of Bright Noah. We can think of Londo Bell as the new and improved Titans, but composed entirely by ex Ayuk and ex Karaba members, so definitely much, much better than the Titans. On the other hand, Neo Zeon's army is led by Supreme Commander Char with his newest mobile suit, the Zazabi, a behemoth custom made red mobile suit that also has Psychoframe cockpit technology and funnels. Nanai Miguel is a lieutenant who is coordinating the attack directly from the battleship. And another more or less important player is Gyune Gus, who is kind of Char's protege and bodyguard and also is the newest cyber new type ace pilot for Neo Zeon. He pilots the Jack Doga, a special unit designed to be used specifically by Neo Zeon new type pilots. And fun story, originally Camille was supposed to return inside with Char. But sadly, that didn't happen, so Gyune is kind of like his stand-in. But if you ask me, I would love to see Camille again. The thing is that by UC0093, new types and cyber new types have been around for more than 10 years, so both armies know that having them in their ranks will give them enough edge to change the outcome of the war. Londo Bell only has Amur Ray, but Zeon has Char. Gyune and towards the end Quest also joins, but I'll talk about her later. Almost all battles throughout Char's counterattack have a new type pilot participating in it, but this time a lot of emphasis is made towards new types being humanity's next and final evolution. What's more interesting for me is that even though Char is allegedly fighting to cause a nuclear winter because he believes that there will always be selfish people living on Earth who must be eradicated and also because people must let the Earth rest and fly to space to become new types as their souls will no longer be weighed down by gravity. Something that sounds super, super poetic and noble. In reality, deep, deep down, Char only wants to finally resolve his business with Amuro and Lala. Char has this new facade where he's working toward this forced new type evolution of humanity for the benefit of the space noids and the Earth itself. And even though his intentions are not as noble, he's doing something that will indeed benefit all of the people that are already living in space. Amuro has a dream where Lala soon appears and tells him that Char is pure. Something that I kind of find hard to believe. Passionate? Yeah. Persistent? Definitely. Powerful even. But pure? Char being pure? 
I don't know about that. Cherry is definitely the main character in this movie. And in my humble opinion, Caswell is really the main actor and true protagonist of all of early Universal Century. It's just that we are being told the story from other people's point of view. First is Amrus, then Camille's, who actually shares a lot of screen time with Quattro, Quattro, and finally Judas. Char is arguably the most important player of those early years, whose very presence is the driving force behind the whole story. First and foremost, he is the son of Zion, whose ideology fueled the Zabis to form the Principality of Zion after his death. A little bit forward in the story, Char was responsible for the death of Garma that caused a profound sadness in the Gwyn and extreme anger in Giren. Giren then, as supreme commander, took full control of Zion's army and went ahead and tried to destroy the Federation. That meant killing his father, who was getting tired of the war. Then, that act of patricide angered Kisilia, who afterward killed Giren and took command of Zion. Too bad that her reign as supreme commander was cut short when Char fired a bazooka at her ship. Next, as Quattro, he joined the Ayuk to try to stop the most corrupt version of the Federation now embodied by the Titans and even went as far as going to Axision to try and convince Haman Karn to stop using Mineva for her selfish purposes. He even declined her offer to rejoin Zion. That in turn angered Haman, and after the defeat of the Titans, she, a supreme commander, took full control of Neo Zion's army and went ahead and tried to destroy the Federation. Why do I feel that I said that already? So, a couple of years after Haman's defeat against the Federation, Caswell took matter into his own hands, declared himself the true successor to Sion's power and ideology, and with his charisma and force of personality, is now leading a new Zion to defeat the Federation and liberate the Earth of the nasty humans that polluted and free the other pure humans from the gravity that weighs down their soul. With all that said, it makes sense that the whole movie revolves around Char and, as a matter of fact, in all of Universal Century series, besides the newer Hathaway's Flash, his name is the only character's name that appears as a subtitle. The name is not Mobile Suit Gundam New Gundam, it's Mobile Suit Gundam Char's Counter-Attack. That's the level of importance of this character. But that doesn't mean that he is a hero. He was definitely revolutionary, but probably heroic is not the best adjective for Char. And don't get me wrong, I think that Char is an amazing character with a lot of depth and the personality is so charismatic that could influence people to their very core. The problem is that his main source of fuel was always resentment, and there was one grievance that always haunted him, the loss of Lal. And that same thing is what would become his only reason to live towards the events of the Second Neo Zeon War. My theory is that after the loss of Camille, even though he more or less made peace with Amru in the Seda era, he stopped caring for the newer generations and lost almost all hope. Then Haman's wrongful attempt of using Mineva and Zeon's people again for selfish purposes totally killed his hope and optimism. After that, he regressed to this all or nothing mentality that was fueled not by hope, but by what? By the only thing that kept unresolved from his past, his resentment of Amru's mindset and Lala's death. Towards the end of his life, Char was motivated only by that selfish reason because, well, probably because he was tired. He had been in many wars and lost many people. To say it brutally, he was dead inside. So, like a defenseless child who clings to his mother in threatening situations, he childishly clinged to the only thing that made him feel anything. Amuro and the thought of Lal. He wanted to end the duel with Amuro that started many years ago. He even went so far as to leak psycho frame technology so that they could fight in equal terms. That doesn't make sense if your main goal was to free humanity from the tyrant federation and the merciless gravity. It's brutal to picture Supreme Commander Char like that, to discover that behind his almighty mask and facade, he's a weak human with a childish goal, and what makes it sadder is that many people are going to die because of that. 
Instead of him dying as a hero in the Grips conflict, he was going to die as the petty villain of the Second New Zealand War. Why? Because war breaks people. That's Tomino's main thesis with Gundam. And it doesn't matter if you are the majestic and prodigious son of a philosopher who is destined to become the space messiah, war will break you and reduce you to your worst. That's the true char of Char's counterattack, and that is what makes his story so powerful. He's a man driven insane by war whose obsession and ego went out of control. So instead of leaning on others for help, like in the Zeta era, he surrendered to his demons and started a new war just to fulfill his revenge and die trying. And that's nothing that can be called pure. Yet, from a character development perspective, his journey is amazing. He went from being an anti-hero in the original Obisid Gundam to being a hero in Zeta to being a villain in his counterattack. Char is not a hero. He is the tragic villain with grandiloquent, heroic delusions. But that same journey is probably why Char outshines Amuro and why his archetype is still used in new Gundam series and even Unicorn and Narrative feature a Char clone. He is a very interesting character that had an amazing story arc throughout the series. So even though we can clearly say that Char is not a hero, for Sion and maybe all of Space Noids, the story is different and he was definitely perceived as heroic. And as with everything in life, it's always a matter of perspective. But we can talk about Char without bringing up Amuro Ray. And as I have said in previous videos, Amuro is not without his merits or charms. Or to put it simply, Amuro is not just for show. <laughs> Throughout early Universal Century, Amuro played a very weird role. I mean, he was the protagonist and probably the hero of the One Year War and the original Mobile Suit Gundam. Yet, in the sequel, Zeta Gundam, he was left with the role of a bystander. Imagine something along the lines of Goku being left as a secondary character when Dragon Ball changed to Dragon Ball Z. More or less something like that happened since Tomino wanted to demonstrate that time did indeed pass in Universal Century. In the Zeta era, Amuro was regarded as a war hero, yet he was feared for his display of new type abilities that were something unheard of. And a little later, the worst offender was Double Zeta, where he is barely mentioned and doesn't even appear. So to see him now as an ace pilot of Londo Bell is something way, way overdue and at the same time very, very interesting. Now, Amuro's role is not as grandiose as Char's role throughout the events of the franchise, yet he has a character arc that is more or less something that we can aspire to. You see, Amuro didn't start as a good pilot. In fact, he was clumsy and doubtful of his action. He even suffered from some sort of PTSD that was cured by the now infamous Bright Slap. So slowly but surely he became a good pilot and also his new type abilities started to manifest when he began to have self-confidence and to trust himself. But after he accidentally killed Lala, he also started to develop this fear of space that continued to haunt him even in this movie. Amuro is a more down-to-earth character, aside from obviously all the new type powers. He is a man that doubted himself, that was unsure of what to do, that was not great from the beginning, that was shunned down by society even though he was a hero. His story is much more relatable and, in my opinion, that is why he is still popular and even Bright Noah has a picture of him in his office. Amuro was also very loyal to his crew and he believed in humanity and even in the Federation, even though some parts of the organization were not of his liking. Instead of being like Char, a leader that moved the masses, he was willing to take the back seat and leave humans alone to figure out what to do in times of peace. Amuro and Char have very contrasting personalities and ways to get stuff done. On the one side we have Char, who is a passionate leader that comes from a great family and was great at everything, and on the other side we have Amuro, who is just a child who worked a lot to get a comfortable life. The key difference was that Amuro never lost hope that even though he was doing little, he was doing the right thing. Whereas Char was devastated when humanity kept doing the wrong things. Amuro can be seen as the working class hero that we can all relate to. There is no glamour in his life, nor any grandiose aspiration of being a public figure with a massive following. No, 
He's a hero because he does the right things and patiently waits for things to figure out themselves. He never takes the front seat of drama, but also never stops to dream of the past or something else. And more importantly, he never loses hope. He is probably not as interesting as Char, but he is definitely much more relatable in a way that maybe no other hero in Gundam can be. He went from a young, clueless and fearful boy to a man with enough skill to lead troops to a war and also enough bravery and courage to end the war with his sacrifice. Char did not believe that his sacrifice would matter, yet the Psycho Frame resonated with Amaro's will and as a new type, he defied expectations and changed the result of the war. Now, if you ask for my humble opinion on who's a better character or has the best story, for that I think that I already said that Char. Casable is an amazing character with a lot of depth and different versions throughout the franchise. But Amuro, Amuro is a greater character from a role model perspective or even as an inspiration. He is the unsung hero that did the right thing almost every time. Yet, it doesn't matter who is better because where Gundam shines the greatest is in the clashing dynamics and the opposing ideals between two factions. In this case, the Red Comet and the White Unicorn. Or the White Devil if you ask the Zeons. The Gundam franchise is filled with opposing ideologies that fuel conflict, and it's much more present in the stories told by Tomina. In the first Mobile Suit Gundam, we have the White Base versus all of Zeon, with the clashing ideals of the young Amuro and the hopeful crew of the White Base against the terrible pressure of Char's vengeance and the Savi's military might and twisted version of Noblesse Oblié for C. In Zeta Gundam, we have Camille's hopeful vision of a future where people can understand each other in order to avoid war and also the presence of the AU, which is composed by both Sian and Federation members and they're against the Titans, who embody the old ways where people with power are willing to sacrifice anything in order for them to keep growing in authority. And also the very presence of Paptimus, who is a new type that uses his power for his own corrupt benefits to the point of manipulating women for his nefarious purposes. Next, in Double Zeta we have Jura helming the Gundam team, who embody the future generation's fun, carefree and light attitude with an even more relaxed bright Noah. They're against a new Sian fronted by Haman, a girl who is burdened by the old ghost of the Sabis, warlike, power-hungry traditions and rigid structures. Here in Char's counterattack, we are back again with the clashing ideologies of Amuro, who represents the hopeful and patient way to see humanity's evolution versus Char's might is right philosophy and ways to act and impose his will. And something very interesting is that aside from their very different personalities, the mobile suit designs also kind of represents their ideals. You see, we can't talk about the Gundam without talking about robots. So the mecha design must also convey ideas and emotions and well, probably I'm reading too much between the lines, but aside from the OG Gundam series where the RX-78 never changed, starting from Zeta Gundam, we can see that the main Gundam has something that represents its pilot. For example, the Mark II is like the original granddaddy, but a little bit more modern, just as Camille was once known as the second coming of Amuro. The Zeta Gundam has a much more angular shape and a transforming gimmick, just as Camille had a much more sharp view about the war and, well, the transformation... That I can't explain beyond the fact that it was a victim of the 80s trend. Yet, in Double Zeta, we have the Double Zeta's transformation that needed other pilots. And that in turn can represent the fact that Jura never lost his friends or his will to fight with his teammates. Here in Char's Counter-Attack, mechanical designer Yutaka Isobuchi did a great job in portraying more or less what Amuro and Char represented in their mobile suits. The Sasabi is a beast, a huge red mobile suit with a lot of firepower that even dwarfed Paptimus Humongous the O. The Sasabi is like the Commander Saku but on steroids. It even has a callback to the original helmet of Char but now sporting the super sinister Mono Eye. And something very curious happens with this machine. 
The cockpit is in the head, not in the chest. It's almost as if the once passionate Char was lost in life. So now, given the fact that he couldn't put his heart into anything, he was just using his military skills and mindset to fulfill his now empty goals. There's a reason why the phrase goes, put your heart into it. Char was willing to put up this monster facade with beam sabers and funnels to compensate for the fact that his heart and his mind were not in the right place. Even Char's other mobile suit, the Nightingale, is much, much more monstrous, discarding even a human-like figure in order to look a lot more menacing, like a mythical and mechanical god dragon who was meant to destroy everything in its past. But if there's a dragon, you bet that there's a dragon slayer, and for that we have our knight in shining armor, Amorous New Gundam. The new Gundam design is like a modern version of the original Gundam with subtle differences that make this machine unique. The silhouette is like that of a medieval knight, with broad shoulder pads and skirt arm and leg armor, and as Amuro grew in size, so did his Gundam. The face is very characteristic with not two but three events, making it the only Gundam in Universal Century to have them, and the B-Fin, even though other Gundams also have a double B-Fin, here, it looks more like a crown adorning this warrior leader. And what makes this mobile suit truly unique is how the fin funnels are arranged. First and foremost, they are asymmetrical, with the six pieces locked behind the right shoulder. And second, some are open and some are closed, giving it the appearance of a mechanical wing. So, if Sion had the red beast of might, Londovel and the Earth had the godly one-winged knight who in its new type found wisdom, instead of being completely just and balanced, leaned asymmetrically towards compassion instead of mighty justice. Now, the build-up towards the battle between these mechanical titans was spectacular, with each one showing off their skills and moves in battles in other mobile suits, yet the battle between the Zazabi and the Nogandam was very short and actually not that brutal. The new Gundam didn't suffer too much, but the Zazabi was completely outclassed, demonstrating that Amuro had finally surpassed Char as a pilot. This is also why I theorized that since Char didn't have his heart in the right place, he couldn't care less about the outcome of the battle. He just wanted to fight once again with Amuro. But Amuro, Amuro did pour his heart and soul into winning the battle because that meant paving the way for a new and better tomorrow for the future generation. And why do I say that? Well, because Char's machinations made it that if Axis fell to Earth, it would cause a nuclear winter, and even though the entire crew of the Rakhalium tried to stop that, a chunk of the asteroid was about to fall. That's when Amuro took things super seriously, defeated the Sasabi, and even grabbed the cockpit where Char was. And in the heat of the battle, Amuro decides that the best way to stop the asteroid is to push it away from the Earth with his mobile suit. Obviously, he's working against the 9.8 meters over second square, so Charles tells him that it is pointless, but Amuro keeps trying to push the asteroid. And in an epoch-making change of events, other mobile suits from the Federation and Neo Zeon start to line up to push away the asteroid. It seems that only in life-threatening situations do people have a change of heart and work together, but the pressure of Earth's gravity is too much and the grunt mobile suits start to fail. And here's where Gundam gets super mystical. Amuro's and Char's cockpit start to resonate with the psycho frame and the wheels of everyone who wanted to stop the rock from falling. The psychic energy from everyone starts to manifest in a greenish light and then a miracle happens. A huge wave of light, like an aurora, starts to move the asteroid away from the Earth. This miraculous event channeled by the wills of everyone was made possible by the new Gundam Psycho Frame and Amuro's hopeful new type powers. This will be remembered by the newer generation as the Axis Shock, an event so great that it seemed that it would finally put an end to the Sion Federation conflict. But, as usual, Fighting and conflict is never ending in the Gundam universe. <laughs>
Universal Century is filled with themes that focus on the new versus old, and here in Charles Counterattack, the points of view of the newer generations were more or less personified by Quest Pariah and Hathaway Noah. Many people dislike Quest, but I think that she is there to embody the concept of when an outdated idea gets ingrained in the mind of a youngster. She was tired of not being heard by her parents and found in Char a parent figure who was brimming with passion and hope for the future, even though we all knew that it was false. But she, in her inexperience, fell into the trap and then, like Paptimus and his harem, Quest was used by Char for her new type abilities, kind of like compensating for the loss of Lala. Quest never developed as she should have. She stayed comfortable in the trance induced by the great charisma and ideals of Char. I think that her purpose in that story is to be a cautionary tale about believing in someone or something blindly, or trying to find in others your reason to live. Maybe that's why Quest is so universally disliked. On the other hand, we have Hathaway who saw the death of Quest and even caused the death of Chan. He was forced to grow very rapidly due to the second Neo Zeon War and even got to see in action both Char and Amuro, so he's more or less in the middle. But I have to be very honest here, I'm not going to be able to talk much about Hathaway since his story only starts in Char's counterattack and fully develops in Hathaway's flesh. And I haven't read the novel nor seen the movie. So I don't want to spoil myself nor spoil you. So I'll tell you this, as soon as the movie finally releases, I'll try to conclude Hathaway's analysis. With that said, and with what I could see in the trailer and the first 15 minutes of the movie, I think that Hathaway's Flash is going to be more akin to Seda Gundam, where the Federation is again leaning towards totalitarianism and that pseudo-terrorist organization Mufti is going to be like a more brutal AU, with Hathaway embodying amorous virtues with Charles might. But then again, Tomino is full of surprises and I don't want to spoil myself, so please do me a favor and don't spoil anything in the comments for me or for other viewers. With this, I conclude my exploration of Char's Counter-Attack, a great movie and a great closing for the original early Universal Century conflict between Zeon and the Federation. Almost everything is greatly done and every character has its defining moment, though I would prefer for it to be a longer series instead of a movie to be able to explore more in depth certain characters and ideas. The good thing is that the manga and the novels explore everything with much more detail. And well, for many many years this was the end of early Universal Century with Hathaway's Flash being only a novel and Gundam F-91 happening 30 years after the Axis shock. But in 2006, a new story emerged which told the saga of a new Seionic conflict, a secret that could overturn the Federation and the appearance of a fully Psycho Frame equipped Gundam. I'm talking about Mobile Suit Gundam Unicorn which is the next entry in my video essay Explorations of Universal Century. I hope you liked my way of explaining and analyzing Char's counterattack without going full summary. And I know that I may have missed a couple of interesting points or many interesting points, so please go ahead and leave them in the comments and I'll do my best to try and answer them as soon as possible. And as you may or may not know, my name is Absa. You can continue the conversation over at Twitter, where you can follow me at Absalonicas, and on Instagram, where I post pictures of my figures, my cats, and sometimes even myself. I'll be trying to talk more about anime, comics, and maybe even figures. Until next time, always remember that in fiction lies power, so let's use it to forge a new type of story, our hero's journey.